Hey everyone, welcome to Judging for the Win. I'm Dave, and this is my daily ruling. Today, I'll be talking about a very important question debated by Magic players for years. What's the most broken card in Magic? Well, if the title and the thumbnail didn't give it away already, it's not the One Ring or Yawgmoth's Will or even Black Lotus. Nope, my vote for the most broken card is a one-mana Professor Oak with no drawbacks other than it might cost you your very soul. Well, something like that anyway. To be honest, I can't remember ever seeing anyone actually play for Anti, so it's easy to forget cards like this even exist, let alone how they work. In fact, I'd wager that some of the people watching might not have even known that Anti cards are still supported in the comprehensive rules even today. Since this video will go live on the day I'm returning home from Sin City, I thought that DDR number 666 would be the perfect time to go over that time gambling was encouraged in Magic. It might be my only chance. What do I have to lose? So first of all, what is Anti? Well, as the name suggests, it is a way of playing for keeps. Yes, that's the official language used to describe it in the CR. If you're playing for Anti, each player anties a random card from their library after deciding who goes first, but before drawing any cards. The Anti zone is a public zone, meaning that all the cards in it are face up, and so each player will know what all of the cards in the Anti zone are at all times. There is currently no known way to have a face down card in the Anti zone. There are a few cards that can put cards in or take cards out of the anti zone, and along with all the other cards that refer to anti or changing a card's legal owner, these cards all say to remove them from your deck before playing if you're not playing for anti. In addition to the normal English meaning of this phrase, there's a rule that says cards with this text cannot be brought into the game, for example via a wish or a booster tutor. Cards in the anti zone still have their same owners during the course of the game. After the game is over, the winner becomes the owner of all the cards in the anti zone. During or before the game, only a card's owner can ante a card. And that basically sums it up. It's actually not that complicated of a mechanic, probably because it wasn't around for very long. I get the feeling that there's a lot of unexplored design space here, but I also get why it wasn't very popular. It's pretty much completely incompatible with tournament magic. Even putting aside the obvious legal concerns, there's still the practical matter of what happens if you lose a key card from your deck mid-tournament. Even in a kitchen table setting, it's not hard to see why people wouldn't want to play for ante. People tend to form strong emotional bonds with their decks and with their cards, and the thought of losing some part of that during a game is a tough pill to swallow. And that's before the issue of which card gets anteed is completely random. I'm told that some people who played for ante had a house rule where lands couldn't be anteed, or that players could mulligan their own or their opponent's anteed cards. These weren't official though, and the baseline was that it would be totally possible to risk your own basic island to potentially win your opponent's Black Lotus. I mean Shivan Dragon. Seriously, who would play that card? It's just three mana. The fact that this turned people off from anti was a little bit ironic because it was cited in the early rulebooks as a way for players to fight back against pay-to-win opponents with bigger bankrolls. Uh, it certainly was a simpler time back then, wasn't it? That last point brings up the final issue that sounded the death knell for anti. You know what the most surefire way to protect your most valuable cards from being anti was? Just don't play them! Certain deck styles relied only on relatively cheaper or more readily available common cards, and certain optimizations could be not worth the meta risk of losing more valuable cards to anti. So players were indirectly encouraged to play certain strategies and avoid others, which aside from not being very fun, went against the core of what Magic was trying to do. Ironically, this too was alluded to in the early Magic rulebook. So now that we've gone through how the mechanic works and some of the background behind it, its rise and fall, Let's close out with a couple of fun example questions that I came up with involving anti-cards. First up, let's say Amy plays a Rebirth. Does Nick know what card Amy anteed when he's deciding whether to ante one himself? And for the answer to this one, let's refer to this rule here, which says that if multiple players have to make choices or take actions at the same time, the players make any decisions required in APNAP order and then take all of the relevant actions simultaneously. So the correct way to resolve the spell is to go around the table in turn order starting with the active player and have everyone say yes or no to the question of whether they want to ante a card. After that, all the players who said yes will move their cards to the ante zone at the same time, and then those players will go to 20 life. This procedure is potentially important to know if you're playing Rebirth with cards that let you look at the top card of your library, or make you play with the top card of your library revealed. Okay, next up, Amy uses a Kiki Jiki to make a copy of Tempest to Free, and then activates the ability of the token. What happens? So unfortunately, the fun pleaser are gonna step in on Amy here. 
Activating the token's ability involves sacrificing it. And after that happens with the ability still on the stack, the token in the graveyard will cease to exist. Given that Nick declines the opportunity to pay 10 life to avoid revealing a random card in his hand, we will get to the instruction to exchange ownership of the card and Tempest Free. Anytime you see the word exchange, there's this rule here that says that if you cannot complete both parts of the exchange, then nothing will happen. Since the token no longer exists, this instruction will not be performed. The rest of the ability will still continue to happen as normal though, except, well, the instruction to put the revealed card into Amy's hand cannot be performed since only a card's owner can put it into their hand. Likewise, the instruction to put Tempest Free into Nick's graveyard cannot be performed either. In case you're wondering, this same ruling would apply in the case where a non-token Tempest Free was activated, but then it was moved from the graveyard to a different zone after the activation. This is because changing zones causes the Tempest Free to become a new object with no memory or connection to its previous self. Thus, when the game tries to exchange ownership of the Tempest Free and something else, it can't do that because the specific Tempest Free that the game is looking for doesn't exist anymore. Maybe now you're wondering why it says to put Tempest Free from anywhere into Nick's graveyard. Well, if there was, say, a rest in peace out while this card was activated, it would end up in the exile zone, having never gone to the graveyard. The game is able to track the Tempest Free to the first zone that it goes to, even if that's not the expected one, meaning that it would be able to find it in exile and put it back into the graveyard. Well, at least it would try to do that, but of course, rest in peace would just exile it again. Interestingly, the game can only track the card this way if it goes to a public zone. So if it was a Wheel of Sun and Moon rather than a Rest in Peace, then the game would not be able to find the Tempest to free, and we would have the same answer as if we had put it into the graveyard and then moved it somewhere else. No exchange can happen. Okay, next question. Amy steals Nick's Jeweled Bird and then activates it. What happens? So with this, we'll follow the instructions in the order that they're written, and right away we see that there's a problem. The first step in the resolution of the ability is to anti-Jeweled Bird. But that can't happen because only a card's owner can anti it. Jeweled Bird is worded such that the rest of the stuff in its ability is contingent upon anteing it. So that stuff doesn't happen either. The Jeweled Bird will just stay on the battlefield and absolutely nothing will happen as the ability resolves. This would also be the case if the Jeweled Bird couldn't be anteed for some other reason. For example, because it had changed zones before its ability resolves, similar to the Tempest Free scenario. Unlike that one though, there's absolutely no problem with anteing an artifact token. So if you can find a way to make a Jeweled Bird token, then you can rescue all of your cards from the anti zone and spend the rest of the game with nothing to lose. Next, let's say that we activate an Amulet of Quaz in a four player game. What happens? Okay, so first of all, yes, there is an actual card that ends the game with a literal coin flip. You know, sometimes I wish that judges could have this card. But anyway, with the modern wording of Amulet, the question gets a lot clearer. After the flip, one player loses and the game just continues with three players, just like if that player would have lost via a door to nothingness or something like that. Easy. And speaking of easy, let's close things out with a few quick hits about how Anti interacts with some other kind of corner cases. First up, how do wish effects play with Anti? Well, we already said that you cannot use a wish to bring an Anti card into a game that is not an Anti game, so that wouldn't work. Also, anti cards are in the Anti zone. This is a zone just like any other one, for example, the Graveyard or Exile. This being the case, anti cards are not outside the game, and so they cannot be brought into the game via one of those either. So there's not a lot of interaction to speak of here. I think another thing that some people are probably thinking about is what would happen if an anti game ends up as a draw? And that's pretty straightforward. After an anti game, the winner becomes the owner of all the cards in the anti zone. If there is no winner, then that doesn't happen. So the cards will stay with their original owners. Well, what if we restart the game with something like Karn Liberated? And if you restart the game, no players win, lose, or draw in the restarted game. So all the cards in the anti zone will not change owners and they'll be shuffled into their owners' libraries, just like all the other cards from that game. A restarted anti game would probably still be played for anti, so the players would anti a new card as part of the process of restarting the game. Interestingly, any cards that are left in exile with Karn would not be eligible to be anteed since they were not part of the library at the time when the game is starting. Finally, what about magic subgames? Okay, so unlike restarting the game, when you start a sub-game, then you leave all of the cards from the main game where they are, including the ones in the anti-zone. And at the end of the sub-game, all of the cards from the sub-game are shuffled into their respective owner's main game libraries. Interestingly, at the end of the game is also when the anti-cards change ownership. I couldn't find any official source for what order these two happen in, but I think it makes a lot more sense for the cards to change ownership first, so that when the cards won from the ante in the sub-game, they'll be shuffled into their new owner's main game library, 
and that's how I would rule if this would come up in an event that I was judging, however unlikely that is to happen. Whew, that was a lot, but now you should know everything there is to know about anti. Honestly, I don't see a whole lot of hope for anti to ever make a comeback to relevancy the way phasing and some other old mechanics did, but I think sometimes it's fun to talk about stuff like this for purely academic purposes, especially on a special occasion like this one. And I could not close out the anti episode without giving a special shout out to my personal favorite anti card. I already said that Contract was probably the most broken, but for my money, Bronze Tablet is the best. That's because in Chandelar, which let's face it is probably the only place where these cards are seeing a lot of play nowadays, the computer is programmed to never concede or pay the time life, meaning that Bronze Tablet basically says four tap, add target permanent card to your collection, which I don't think I have to tell you how much that can progress your account. Next time you're in a Nomad's Bazaar, make sure you clean them out. You'll be glad you did. But that's all I have for you today. How did you do? Join me again next time for another daily ruling, but until then, I hope you have a great day.